हाय अभिनव हाय उदित हाय गुड टू यू Oh, excellent! We have nearly, nearly fifty registrations. That's great. How is everyone? And what times? Uh, Abhinav, are you in Delhi? Yes, Abhinav, sorry, yeah, Abhinav. So everyone's uh, on IST. We're we're not troubling you at an ungodly hour. No. Okay. Gita <laughs> uh, ji is on mute. Huh? Yes. So I said it's a fairly decent hour to be troubled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you all for joining us this is great we've been looking forward to it um so i think we decided uh, in terms of format and you know we, we can we can change this a bit uh, i think kalpana might speak for about 30 minutes and then abhinav and geeta for 15 minutes each is is that okay yeah i i yeah i mean we'll Turn it around as we go. Yeah, on. that's that's fine. Yeah, yeah, and and I think we have the Zoom link active for two hours. Uh, we we don't expect we'll go on for two hours, but we we do have the link. Um, and what we might do is after the discussants have given their comments, we might go back to Kalpana and you know if you have a response to the discussants' comments, and then we can open it up for questions. In terms of how the questions will work, I think. um alice uh, could you advise us on this i i believe people are going to put their questions in the chat box yes that's correct they'll show up in a chat box um okay. which i think we'll all be able to see all right excellent what i can then do is uh, because you'll all be busy answering questions i can uh, i can take up those questions and pass them on to you uh, if there are similar questions i can club them together and paraphrase them and put them to you um yeah and we'll uh we'll we'll encourage the audience to uh mention if the question is for any one panelist in particular or if you know they're happy for anyone on the panel to answer that i think the best thing to do Udit, for this webinar is to um make a note of who has raised their hand and then i can uh, allow them to talk and they can ask their question verbally as well oh you you can you can let them in um into the call Uh yeah they can speak if they're um granted access to do so once they've oh. raised their hand yeah excellent i think uh, the last seminar we had we were slightly cautious about uh trolls mm -hmm. during the zoom room so we 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 did it just on you know we, we've heard of colleagues who've hosted seminars on constitutional legal stuff and they've been zoom bombed so we kept audience q and a to chat but uh in retrospect i think yeah that might be uh might be too cautious so yeah it'll be nice to have them come into the call great we have some people joining now i think we've got seven people in the webinar all right should we give them 5 minutes i think that's what um, we did last time yeah they're just joining now it's it's sort of running now so you're free to start when whenever all right I'll just give maybe two more minutes for everyone to come in.
Are we okay to start, Alice? Yeah, please do. We have 10 attendees with us. All right, excellent. Perfect. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the second book talk as part of the PAC event series. I'll start by just saying a little bit about the project and then I'll introduce our speakers for today. So PAC uh, stands for Pluralist Agreement and Constitutional Transformation. The project comprises Roshan Bajpai, who's a prin principal investigator from SOAS, myself representing York, Nicholas Cole from Oxford, Sudhir Krishnaswamy from NLS Bangalore, and Vineet Krishnan from CLPR, of course, Alice Winter as our project manager. We are funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. And uh, PAC aims to develop an advanced digital platform on the making of the Indian Constitution. So the platform is going to bring together for the first time, not just the plenary debates, but also committee discussions, petitions, and public responses during the making of the Constitution. And it will build a comprehensive timeline that allows for a deep dive into the history of the Indian Constitution. And we hope that it will help with um, further research on the Constitution through the PAC PAC team, but also for other researchers and indeed practitioners. Um, as part of this project, we're also hosting a series of public events and book talks. Um, so this is one of them, but do watch the space. Our website is pacproject.net and you can find further updates on our events and other blog features that we'll be hosting over the years to come. Um, so with that, I'm going to go on to introduce our speakers for today. We've got with us uh, Kalpana Kanabiran, who's a sociologist, legal researcher, and human rights campaigner based in Hyderabad. She's researched and written in the areas of sociology of law, historical sociology, social movements, gender studies, disability studies, Adivasi rights, minority rights, and development studies. She has received the VKR Virao Prize for Social Science Research in 2003, and that was for her work in the field of social aspects of law. And she's also received the Amartya Sen Award for Distinguished Social Scientist in 2012 for her work in the discipline of law. Her publications include Tools of Justice, Non-Discrimination and the Indian Constitution in 2012, Law, Justice and Human Rights in India, Short Reflections in 2021. And more recently, she edited and translated The Speaking Constitution, A Sisyphean Life in Law by K.G. Kannabiran, and is the editor of Rutledge Readings on Law and Social Justice and Rutledge Readings on Law Development and Legal Pluralism. So we're very pleased to have uh, Kalpana with us today. And we've also got two discussants commenting on, uh, on her book. We've got V. Gita, who is a feminist activist, writer, and historian from Chennai. She studied at Madras Christian College and the University of Iowa, and has been active in the women's movement for several, year, several years, and has done lectures for women's workers, activists, and students. She was instrumental in setting up the Tamil Nadu Women's Coordination Committee and was also an active member of Snehidi, a women's group that worked with those who faced abuse in the family. This work was carried on for over eight years in association with the Tamil Nadu State Legal Aid Board. Some of her notable publications include Towards a Non-Brahmin Millennium, From Ayoti Thas to Periyar, co-authored with S. V. Rajadurai, and Undoing Impunity, Speech After Sexual Violence. Our second discussant for today is Abhinav Sekri, who is a legal researcher and practicing lawyer. He has an undergraduate degree from the National Law School in Bangalore and a master's degree from Harvard. His work has featured in leading academic journals as well as leading news outlets, and he's written on criminal law and adultery, preventive detention, politics of prosecution, money laundry, among various other issues on criminal law. He runs the widely cited and influential blog, Proof of Guilt. So very, very privileged to have all three of you with us today. How we're going to run this is Kalpana will give uh, her opening comments for about 30-ish minutes, and then we'll have brief responses from both our discussants. So over to you, Kalpana. Oh, uh, you're on mute. Thank you, uh, Udit. I'm uh, also grateful to the PAC project for this, uh, for organizing this book discussion um, and to uh, Geeta and Abhinav for readily agreeing uh, to be on this panel. And I really look forward to this discussion. How I thought I might actually uh, go about uh, what I have to say today is to organize, uh, organize my talk in four parts. Uh, the first, in the first part, I will look at 
uh, with speaking constitution itself and set out uh, the broad scheme uh, of the book. Uh, in the second part, I will uh, look at uh, what I call kindred texts that circulate around this book. In the third part, uh, I, I will look at two uh, specific uh, preludes uh, to the speaking constitution. And uh, the fourth is what I call familial intimacies. So uh, to begin with, uh, what is the broad scheme of, of speaking constitution for those who have not yet seen it? Uh, the book is basically uh, a memoir that's not quite a memoir. So it is a memoir. It, uh, it is uh, a political professional uh, memoir uh, this, uh, with, with a very, very uh, brief reflection on, uh, the, on the private life of K.G. Kanabiran, who was my father. And... Uh, focuses much more on his work in law. The uh, entire book, all the 18 chapters in the book, are focused on specific interventions that he made as a lawyer, either in courts, and these could be trial courts, uh, the high court or the Supreme Court, uh, on fact-finding missions and committees, and before citizens' tribunals, as well as commissions of inquiry. So in these different spaces, the uh, chapters in this volume are his personal reflections on the ways in which he engaged with the letter, text, and spirit of the law in relation to the spirit of the Constitution as he understood it. Broadly, I would identify uh, across these 15, uh, across these 18 chapters, five themes. One uh, overarching uh, theme that covers maybe five or six of the chapters uh, uh, pertains to the politics of radical left movements and the ways in which this politics gets negotiated and represented in courts of law through conspiracy trials, through uh, preventive detention laws, through peace processes, through suspension from uh, government jobs, the various ways in which the state acts to repress uh, activists in the radical left movements at that time, uh, uh, the Mao Marxist-Leninist movements in the state of Andhra Pradesh. The second broad uh, category of uh, reflections have to do with state violence, encounter, encounter deaths, custodial deaths, and disappearances. The third uh, broad theme, if one can call it that, has to do with the death penalty, where he reflects on the various ways in which he, uh, he, he, he understands the, the death penalty. Uh, these include cases where he intervened and his reflections on the execution of Afzal Guru, uh, where he was present at the trial at the, in the parliament attack case as the lawyer who appeared for Shaukat Guru. So in that sense, he was an insider to the parliament attack case and he reflects on the trial of Afzal Guru. The fourth set of uh, cases that he looks at have to do with the rights of Dalits, particularly in the context of atrocity and reservations. And the rights of Adivasis, particularly with reference to Schedule 5 areas and the protections of Schedule 5 areas. With reference to uh, the protections on, uh, you know, around Schedule 5 areas, uh, the case that he reflects on is in fact a precursor to PISA, the Panchayat Extension to Scheduled Areas Act, which was enacted in 1996. The case that he argued in the AP High Court resulted in a stay in the application of the Panchayat Act to scheduled areas and uh, the, the whole move towards the enactment of PISA was then hastened because I think uh, both in Andhra and in Bihar, the High Court had stayed the operation of Panchayat Acts in scheduled areas. And that was a huge protection 
uh, in relation to questions of land rights of Adivasis. The uh, second case to do with Adivasi rights also had to do with uh, the Polavaram case where uh, uh, the submergence by the Polavaram Dam project uh, threatened to uh, affect hundreds of villages. And his argument, I remember clearly at this time, I tried to see if I could find his written arguments and I couldn't, but his arguments at that time was that you can't interfere with the boundaries of Schedule 5 areas without presidential assent. And if you are going to, uh, if your project is going to result in the submergence of uh, Schedule 5 areas, it means you are altering the boundaries of the areas and that cannot be done without presidential assent. So uh, the Polovaram case and the, the Panchayat Act, the precursor to PISA, where the, his major interventions in the area of Adivasi rights. And then there are a whole cluster of cases around um, religious nationalism, Hindutva, uh, genocidal violence, uh, the targeting of Muslims through the criminal justice system. He looks at the Coimbatore bomb blast accused. He defended the Coimbatore bomb, bomb blasts accused in the trial court. Uh, he was on the tribunal uh, in Gujarat. He was uh, an amicus with uh, uh, Professor Latika Sarkar in the Ayodhya tribunal. And he reflects on all of these uh, different uh, interventions and also uh, appeared before the PK Shamsundar Commission in the case of violence against six students in Bidar in 1988. And uh, so all of these very wide ranging uh, cluster of cases were cases that he had a personal appearance in and uh, reflects on in, in various chapters. And what you will see, uh, and, and what, what I have actually uh, uh, kind of uh, found uh, quite exciting about that, uh, you know, about his narration of the, of the various cases is that he dwells in great detail on the uh, on, on the techniques of the law and the way in which one might interpret the application or non-application of prescribed procedure through a political lens. Why is this particular provision being misapplied? Uh, or uh, what is it that hampers judges, even when they recognize that there is a wrong being perpetrated, what is it that hampers judges from actually censuring either police officers or the state, despite the recognition that the state or the police officers are in the wrong? And this is a question that he asks repeatedly. And of course, he repeatedly uh, uh, keeps raising the same questions, never tiring of raising them in courts. The various spaces that he appears in, uh, like I said, are fact-finding missions um, and courts of different jurisdiction. Right from the first case that he argues, which is the case of a, a Muslim woman from Madras, Ansari Begum, uh, who uh, is faced with a deportation order in 1958, and that is his first case. He moves soon after from Madras to uh, Hyderabad. Uh, and that is a case that uh, he argues in the uh, court of the chief presidency magistrate. Uh, I have uh, written a longer piece on the Ansari Begum case where I've juxtaposed that case with another case that comes up at the same time in the state of Andhra Pradesh, where the petitioners originally from Baluchistan, but staying in rural Andhra, actually go up to the high court and the Supreme Court asking for the right to stay back uh, in India. Uh, and asking for a right to Indian citizenship. So there are, uh, in, in a sense, what is also uh, true of the cases is that uh, if you look at it from where we are today, you find that there is, uh, you know, it, it's uh, pretty much the same concerns that we are battling. And what we, uh, seem to have in his narration of the way in which the case uh, is argued and taken forward is possibly 
some kind of a guide on how one might navigate a hostile state and a hostile court or a not too, not too friendly court um, in uh, cases of human rights violations particularly. A large number of the cases to do with the radical left had to do with writers and poets whose uh, poetry uh, was proscribed or who were thrown out of government jobs because they were revolutionary poets. Uh, the, uh, so the, the, uh, basically the point then in the first part of what I'm trying to say is that through a reading of the various cases uh, and the various issues, that he handled, one sees different shades of his engagement, sometimes on the same issue, like with the Maoists or the Marxist Leninists or the radical left, you have cases to do with emergency and preventive detention, and you have the peace process at two ends. Uh, with several of the cases, you find um, engagements at, at very different levels, and that in, in itself is instructive. There are, of course, uh, texts that I, for me, for instance, I, I don't see uh, the speaking constitution as uh, something that stands on its own. Uh, we already have uh, several of the readers, and I, I've been following social media on readers' comments, and several of the readers are kind of juxtaposing the speaking constitution to uh, his earlier book, Wages of Impunity. Um, also to, to the documentary film, The Advocate. Uh, but if you look at the actual chronology of the, um, of, the, of the events or the comments, it is in fact the speaking constitution that is prior to Wages of Impunity. So in Wages of Impunity, what he gives us is, um, are his political and philosophical arguments on the place of human rights in constitutional uh, jurisprudence and the place of the constitution in the Indian polity. Um, he refers in passing to several of the cases that he has appeared in, but uh, not in any great detail. He, he focuses in wages of impunity on broader questions of human rights. Now, all of those broader questions of human rights are questions that draw on his litigation experience that is actually in the speaking constitution. So it's, it, you in fact find if, uh, if you go back to the speaking constitution, you are actually able to reconnect several of his arguments in wages of impunity uh, to the speaking constitution. Um, as as an aside, I mean, I you know, it's also very difficult for me to uh, not get anecdotal about uh, either of these texts. Um, as as an aside, uh, you know, uh, in Wages of Impunity, uh, he refers to the Gopalan judgment on page thirty one as the first Indian Indian made foreign judgment. And I thought, you know, uh, I'd just like to share a bit of a, uh, a bit of why he chuckled when he actually hit upon this caption. Uh, in the early 1990s, there was the anti-liquor struggle in Andhra Pradesh, and it was total prohibition. So locally brewed alcohol, Arik, as well as what was called IMFL, Indian made foreign liquor. And he was uh, somebody who enjoyed his Indian made foreign liquor. And he would always chuckle when off offering a guest or a friend, he'd say, he'd say, do you want IMFL? I have IMFL. That was the only thing he stocked on his own. And when he was writing Gopalan, I, the Gopalan article, Personal Liberty Post Independence, I think, this suddenly kind of clicked. And he said, this is the first Indian made foreign judgment. And I remember him telling me, you know, how do you think this sounds? Isn't it great Indian made foreign judgment? And the connection was in fact to uh, something quite uh, away from the constitution and constitution speak. It had its connections with 
the state nomenclature of IMFL. On uh, that, there, there has also been considerable uh, comment on uh, the the his use of uh, Sisyphus, uh, and there have been kind of mixed uh, responses to his use of the figure of Sisyphus. Uh, one that his was not a losing battle, so uh, why do you call it Sisyphus? The other that if he knows that the stone is going to keep rolling down, then what is he doing wrong? Why Sisyphus? Uh, the, uh, and I think that uh, his own, uh, and, and it, it certainly was his self-image, uh, it, it wasn't either about uh, not achieving a goal or uh, not getting the goalpost right. Uh, it was about the tenacity to pursue the path, uh, if provided you know that you have your facts and your law right, to push it to see how much it needs to be pushed in order to be able to achieve that goal. So he was quite focused on the end, on, on what is it that he wanted from this particular effort. And uh, the, the longer part of his uh, quotation on Sisyphus is that mine is not a struggle, a futile struggle like Sisyphus. For me, the struggle is its own reward. And uh, that was the route through which he uh, kind of approached the figure of Sisyphus. Uh, why did I put Sisyphus in the subtitle here? Because for wages of impunity, and my friends in Orient Longman, actually in Orient Black Swan actually sent me the 2001 contract for the wages of impunity. Uh, and uh, very clearly, when I asked him for the title, because I was handling the publishing arrangements at that time, he said there can be only one title. It has to be called Reflections of Sisyphus. And so the contract of Orient Longman for wages of impunity says Reflections of Sisyphus, which is then circled in ink uh, with a note saying changed to wages of impunity. So this, uh, when I did this book, I uh, felt that I actually had a responsibility to get Sisyphus into the title because that's really what he badly wanted. Um, there are two other texts and here I move to the third part of what I'm trying to say. And there are two other texts that I think are uh, through light and that helped me uh, process the material on which the speaking constitution is based. Apart from the uh, Telugu original, Irenal Gantalu, there were two other uh, uh, you know, uh, texts that actually uh, helped me to, um, to understand better what it is that I was dealing with. One was, of course, uh, my mother's memoir, which was published in 2019, uh, called uh, Taken at the Flood. Uh, much as uh, Kanabiran doesn't uh, focus on the personal, you will find that side of the story in Taken at the Flood, along with the politics. It could, of course, and is probably a gender thing, um, but it is gender mixed with the kind of person he was. Uh, so Taken at the Flood, which I will reflect on a little more in the final section, is one part of it. And the second was that in 2020, which marked 10 years of his passing, uh, we approached several lawyers who had uh, worked with him, lawyers and legal scholars who had worked closely with him over many years, uh, asking them to reflect on their experience of working, co-authoring, collaborating uh, with him in particular cases or in tribunals. Uh, we reached out to about 25 and 14 of them responded. And we um, uh, then later pub uh, published those uh, essays. They were up on YouTube in his channel and uh, published in Live Law and subsequently as a book. And just hearing uh, 14 people from the legal profession speak 
about his engagements in various cases gave me a very different feel of his work. You know, there was a tactility to it that I uh, felt I was missing till I actually heard these lawyers uh, speak about these cases. And I particularly remember uh, two of them. One is his uh, junior, based in Hyderabad, uh, senior advocate, Nalin Kumar. And uh, the other is uh, the lawyer in uh, Tamil Nadu who assisted him in the Coimbatore bomb blasts case, Papa Mohan, uh, both of whose lectures uh, I found really quite fascinating. And uh, I thought what I should do, because they uh, both reflect specifically on, uh, on, on cases where they were present with him in court, I thought I would just read a, a short excerpt from uh, Nalin Kumar's lecture. In a case in 1981, senior filed a habeas corpus writ petition challenging the preventive detention of one Kotadas, who was reputed to be a notorious criminal. This is an unreported case. At the hearing, Chief Justice Alladi Kupuswami queried, what Mr. Kanebiran, you are appearing for Kotadas? Senior retorted, I do not know my lords whether I'm appearing for Kotadas or the future chief minister. And we can, of course, say that again and several times over again in our times. I uh, then want to kind of move. I have like 15 minutes, I think. I, I want to move to um, reading some excerpts uh, from the speaking constitution. And I selected excerpts, all of them, uh, that circulate around uh, the emergency. Uh, the first one, anyone who expressed dissent, even when the grounds of their dissent were valid, were thrown in jail. Countless others were detained without reason. Members of the jamaat e islami and RSS were arrested. There was a young boy, 15 years of age, by name Bhavani Shankarudu. My last petition in emergency cases was filed on his behalf. He later became a leader of the Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh. One day, after arguing her habeas corpus case in the court of Justice Sambhasevi Rao and Gangadhar Rao, I came out and lit a cigarette. This was soon after the Supreme Court ruled that Misa was valid law. Bhavani Shankarudu was produced in court. When the judges asked him who his lawyer was, the young boy said, Kannabiran. He must have been instructed to do this in jail. The judges immediately said, Kannabiran has just left the court hall, call him back. I went in, taking one look at the boy who had not yet grown a mustache. I said to the judges, if the law says that a boy like this poses a threat to internal security, it is a useless law. The government leader stood up and stated to the bench, even before he was asked his opinion, that these detentions should simply be confirmed in the light of the Supreme Court judgment in the Misa case, and that there was no need to argue the case. I turned to him with a repartee. I don't think you have become a judge yet. I would be quick to respond to every situation like this before me in courts. And in the context of the center now providing the Supreme Court with an SOP, I think this kind of um, anecdote is instructive. The second has to do with the investigations of the Tarkunde Committee. When I was inquiring into the Giraipali incident, I came to know that people who had been illegally arrested in connection with this incident had been de detained in the Nilagiri Tota dark bungalow in Mulugu in Medak district. This guest house belonged either to the forest department or the public works department. A few SPs and DSPs had camped there for, for a few days. I asked the watchman of the guest house to bring me a guest register. On the precise dates of the encounter, there was an entry that showed that the district SP, Subhash Chandra Bose, had stayed in that guest house. I circled his name and put my signature, KG Kanabiran, Secretary, Tarkunde Committee. I called the watchman and took his signature on the register copy. I noted the names of the guests before and after the entry and the dates of their stay. This would make it impossible for them to tear off the pages and destroy the evidence.
I will move uh, from here to the, the concluding part of uh, what I wanted to talk about today, which is that uh, we know that Karnabiran was extremely tenacious in his defense of civil liberties, and that he did this every day for 50 years without a break, starting in 1958. And here I want to flag the place of familial intimacies, politics, and the place of reproductive labor and caregiving in the consistent tenacity that he displayed towards his work. The person, of course, that I'm talking about is my mother, Vasant Kanabiran, who, like I said, published her memoir in 2019. She is a teacher. She was a teacher of English literature, uh, is a writer and poet and translator. She was teaching and working full time in most of the years before and after the emergency and a primary carer for three children, her, uh, her spouse and an elder, some at, for some time his mother and for the rest of the time her mother. And I would like to, uh, uh, you know, before I go to reading an excerpt from her memoir, which in, is instructive in our understanding his, I would also like to mention that she was a translator and in his accounts of the work of the Tatkunde committee, one of the things that he mentions in passing was that his home was like a factory and she was editing statements that other volunteers were typing out. So she was doing this besides all the other things that she was doing. And if the home was like a factory, then one can imagine the kind of labor that went in to keeping that home both a home and a factory. She also translated Varavar Rao's poetry. She was his first translator when he was in jail and it was published later as The Captive Imagination, a book that my father released the year before he died. And more recently translated uh, Gadar's poetry into English. The first, the first page of her memoir taking, taken at the flood goes like this. Chapter one, the Muktadar Commission. It was 1978, a year marked by many beginnings, a, a, a year that marked many beginnings for the women's movement in India. The commission of inquiry into the rape of Ramiza B was being held in a packed hall in Hyderabad. There was barely any room to move. The air was heavy with anticipation. It was a courtroom setting with a witness box and a place for the accused and about half a dozen lawyers. The crowd was mostly made up of men from the city jostling to see what would happen. Trying to get a look at the victim, she had not been brought in yet. There was also a group of middle-class women there determined to survive the crush and jostling and observe the trial. There was heavy police presence. After she was brought into the hall, Ramiza was asked to lift her veil so that the man who was appearing as a witness against her could look at her face and confirm, yes, it was her. And then would go on to give a date and the name of a lodge. She would then lower her veil only to be told to lift it once again a few minutes later for the next witness. Each time the crowd would hold its breath in anticipation and then a titter would ripple through the hall. Every time the response was the same. It was systematic, deliberate, serial public rape, unquote. Tani Biran also speaks of the Muktadar Commission of Inquiry in his memoir, and you will see a very different uh, account of the case uh, from his side. And then about their relationship. We were not a conventional couple. We didn't go everywhere together. 
There are very few photographs of us together. Nothing really after our wedding photographs. There is one picture of both of us from recent years on the road to Butikonda Bilam, where the Maoists held their meeting before the peace talks. We were going to a meeting before the peace talks with the Maoists. That picture seemed to capture the long road we had traveled together so aptly that I displayed prominently at home. There were so many requests from press photographers to pose together, but I always said, no, we don't go together like a horse and carriage. Kanebiran agreed, though it would probably wouldn't have made the slightest difference to him. Nor did he feel threatened or slighted when I refused to be publicly coupled with him as the faithful woman behind the successful man. It was I who would get swallowed up, erased by his aura. It was my individuality that was at stake. He was free. Yet, despite all the years we lived together, we always maintained our individuality. We treasured each other, but differed intensely on certain issues and argued constantly. The difference was not merely that there was what there was. The difference was not merely what there was in popular perception of an upper class, upper caste, short haired, cigarette smoking bourgeois feminist and a man of the people. Few people are sensitive enough to appreciate that difference. And finally, my role in Kanabiran's life was to keep his, uh, was to help keep his feet firmly planted on the ground, debunk the praise and the praisers, and keep my own admiration for the phenomenon he had become at a low key so that he could retain his ordinary human qualities and not become some larger than life figure. I helped him to stay in touch with himself, an ordinary man who was fortunate enough to lead an extraordinary life without losing his ordinariness. And I think for me, the speaking constitution is really a cluster of texts. It is his account of what he did in court. It is his philosophical ruminations that follow in wages of impunity. It is his speaking to the camera in The Advocate and several people speaking along with him. And it is the reflections of my mother as well as the other lawyers who worked with him because we can scarcely forget that this was not his individual accomplishment. He was firmly rooted in a large movement uh, that cost lives and risk to the largest number of people. And she similarly was also rooted on her own in a large political movement. Uh, and uh, with uh, both of them uh, writing political memoirs that intersect in uh, moving and instructive ways. Thank you. Thank you. That was fascinating. Uh, I'm going to hand over to our discussants. I don't know if you've decided an order between the two of you, uh, but over to Abhishek and Geeta. How would, uh, should, Geeta ji, would you want to go first or would you want me to go first? What? It doesn't matter to me. Do you want to go first? Uh, I'd actually prefer if I could go second. If sure. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Udit and Pat, for inviting me to be a discussant. And um, I'm going to go straight into what I wish to share with you today. Um, my discussion is going to focus on three things, some of which um, will set you into what Kalpana has already um, put forth. And perhaps some of it is um, has to do with things that we could take forward in our discussions later on. So to start with, I want to start on a very sort of short anecdotal note, because um, for a while I was a member of the People's Union for Civil Liberties in Tamil Nadu. And this was in the 90s um, into the early 2000s. And um, I therefore had the opportunity to work with civil liberties uh, people from the rest of India, particularly the composite state of Andhra Pradesh. and. Um, and I was fortunate enough to spend time both with uh, K.G. Kanabiran and the late K. K. Bal Gopal. And I think in different ways, both of them symbolized for me 
aspects of the civil liberties movement in India as such. And I want to start from, um, from that point because what uh, reading the speaking constitution reminded me was that um, a man like K.G. Kanabiran, who labored at the courts for more than half a century and relied on the spirit of the constitution and the details of everyday lawyering to uh, remind us of our constitutional values and to remind the state of its constitutional duties. But also, Kanabiran's work was also something that inspired those of us who were not part of the legal profession, and who were drawn into the civil liberties movement because it stood for a defense of fundamental rights, or as we would say in today's context of constitutional values. And I think this aspect of his work that he spoke of his own work and the work of the civil liberties movements in public context in ways that inspired an entire generation of people to assist with civil liberties work, to be part of either the PUCL or the APCLC or the HRF or PUDR. And in that sense, for many of us, the civil liberties work undertaken in different parts of the country constituted a veritable movement. And if I'm not mistaken, and Kalpana, I'm sure, will agree to this, the campaign part, the meetings convened in at least the composite state of Andhra Pradesh were actually mass meetings. Civil liberties uh, movements convened meetings where hundreds of people participated. It wasn't like a small group of lawyers or, or citizens who knew um, everything there was to know about the fundamental rights of the constitution. So I think that is an important aspect of the kind of work pioneered by Kanabiran and others. And it is this voice that I find in the speaking constitution, this voice of a civil liberties practitioner and a lawyer who takes responsibility for civil liberties in a broad social sense. And let's not forget that these essays were originally written in Telugu and in a newspaper which meant that he was communicating these concerns and values to a very wide audience. He was reminding a generation of matters that had transpired over the last 25 to 30 years at a moment when there were serious questions being raised about the validity of the constitution. And this is prior to 2014. And we need to remind ourselves of that because I think what such a recall of constitutional and legal labor does is to Reminders of our continuous wrangling with the state of the Indian nation and with the Indian nation state. And, um, and I think, therefore, these essays for me are also exercises in public memory, in reminding a new generation of what it has taken to retain a modicum of faith in constitutional values. And here the Sisyphean metaphor comes in handy because it's a labor that never is entirely done. And I'm reminded of someone from my own state, who is E.B. Ramasamy Peria, who when he was asked at the age of 93, you, you've waged a war against caste all your life. And what victories have you seen? And he used this very telling metaphor. He said, fighting caste is like pushing back a boulder with a string of hair. You can only achieve that much movement. And you know, it's not accidental that he uses the metaphor of the boulder also, like Sisyphus is boulder. So I think it's interesting that um, Kanabiran sort of saw his own labor as a kind of a Sisyphean labor because it's never quite done, but it still must be done and must be done in a spirit not only of uh, choicelessness, but also one chooses to do it. And I think that is what is writ large in this, in this volume. And, and I think for me, what is so important about owning up to the civil liberties movement as a veritable democratic rights and people's movement is the manner in which his generation of civil liberty activists spent time with the people. Kalpana, of course, referred to how their home was open to people all the time. And very recently, Vasant Kanabiran spoke of the number of times that there were people visiting them. She spoke of this in the context of the death of Gadar, um, that their home was always full of petitioners and ex and present and former revolutionaries, all of whom had some case, some suit that they wish to press ahead with. So in that sense, there was that um, sort of continuous and renewed touch with the people of India, if I might use such a grand phrase. And you see this in the nitty gritties of narration in this text. For me, the most poignant thing was when he was called upon to argue, assist with the arguments for the Coimbatore bomb blast case, 
he expressed that he was very tired. And, and clearly, it's a very, and the 90s were terrible years. So, but he nevertheless went along and he was present for the arguments. And what's very poignant and moving is the manner in which he called attention to, to the conditions of incarceration uh, of, of the Muslim prisoners in this case. And that to me bespoke a certain commitment to the people of India, that it is not simply arguing in court, but being in touch with the lived realities of incarceration, violence, and everyday suffering. And you see this in almost every instance, the number of times people like him and Bal Gopal spent their hours, their days, in the actual sites of violations. And I think that's a very important aspect of civil liberties work, which sadly today is hardly remembered. Much of it is seen in terms only of the courts and the law but not in terms of how this work involved a continuous engagement with people that bore the brunt of violations. So that's something that I find is sort of, you know, throughout this text, you have those descriptions of what exactly constitutes civil liberties labor. And, and right from the sort of uh, education of witnesses, and Kanabiran, of course, avoids the word tutoring. He says, you just have to create the conditions for witnesses to say what they wish to say. So I think starting from something like that to being present in these sites and then to take the story ahead in different ways. I remember escorting him once to a PUCL conference in Pondicherry along with another well-known writer from India, an anti cards writer. And they didn't see eye to eye on some things. It was wonderful to hear the kind of conversations between the two of them throughout this four hour drive that we took. So there was there was this constant communication with the larger public, which I think created the conditions for many of us to see civil liberties work as crucial as something that concerned each one of us as citizens. And I think this is something that's important to remember and amplify in today's context when there's a great deal of interest in defending the Constitution of India. But often we don't quite know what that means. What does it mean to defend the Constitution of India? Does it mean to hold it as a sacred text? Does it mean that you granted the stat status of an icon? And I think there are lessons to be learned from the history of those years in which um, a man like Kannabiran was active and present. And this reminds me of, of uh, some of Dr. Ambedkar's uh, uh, speeches towards the end of his life when he addressed students for the most part, especially students of law. And he spoke at length about the need for developing protocols for argument, dissent, and dialogue that it was very important to actually argue and convince your opponent to be open to views that you don't wish to hear. And I think a civil liberties movement trained one to do that, that even if you knew full well that the police officer in that particular taluk was the one that was responsible for breaking someone's hand, you jolly will interview the man. That was a discipline that the movement taught many of us, that you will not prejudge him. You will listen, you will heed his point of view, and then you will see what needs to be done once you write your report. I think these were wonderful lessons that some of us were fortunate enough to learn. And that's the first part of what I wish to say. The second thing is um, to go on with what I had um, mentioned earlier. What does it mean to defend the Constitution? And there are, of course, many things that one can of course, speak of. But I want to call attention to something that um, is very central to uh, the work that Kanabiran undertook during the emergency and the long um, durée when um, he worked with um, those from the radical left who were either encountered or who were incarcerated and faced police violence or were just murdered in their homes. And, um, and I think what comes through very clearly in, in, in his descriptions of the work that he and others undertook at that time is the right to politics. It's not simply the right to dissent or the right to hold opinions, but that in a democracy, a citizen it's right to say no, to say yes, to argue, to be defiant, to call um, government and the state to order. All of these together collectively express the right to politics. And I think it's Kanabiran's um, legal acumen that defines the right to politics um, as no less than the right to life itself. I mean, I mean, his whole interpretation of the right to life is very closely linked to his understanding of how that life can only be a richly led life if it has the right to dissent, to rebellion, and to ask questions. So I think there's this very interesting manner in which he works with the right to life. 
which is a constitutional um, mandate, but he also locates it in a context where it's not simply about the right to life in a broad sense, but it also is a life to li right to life in its granular details. Whether those details have to do with politics, whether those details have to do with the right to integrity, which is how he uh, defines the right that is sought by someone who is a victim of sexual assault in the book. And of course, that's a definition he owed to Vasant because it's a women's movement who defined rape as a crime against bodily integrity. So I think this is a very important aspect of uh, trying to make sense of this, this important demand that all of us have, that we must protect our constitution. And I think a fundamental aspect of that protection must be surely to insist on the right to politics, which I think governments are all too happy to suspend for various reasons. And which, as is clear from Kannabiran's own account, starting from the 1960s, has been suspended often enough. So there has been a sort of continuous history of attempts by the Indian state to suspend the citizens' right to politics and to sort of substitute the sovereignty of the people of India with the sovereignty of the state. And I think this is something that civil liberties work has always been concerned about, that the people must and will always be sovereign. And the state can only relate to sovereignty as an expression of the people's will. And I think running through Kanabiran's work with um, emergency, uh, on the emergency, during the emergency, and his defense of political prisoners, and the work he did with regard to encounters, encapsulates this aspect of, of constitutional uh, morality, if you will. And, and, and this, I think, is an aspect of, of, of the defense of the constitution that in my understanding ought not to be only um, related to the defense of specific liberties, which of course are very important, or ask for the repulsion of specific laws, which again is very important, but also state and restate the citizens' right to politics in a democratic polity, which I think is a, is a very hard one, right? Because as Ambedkar never fails to remind us, democracy is not an attribute of Hindu caste society. And it's a value that we have built in a very, very, difficult circumstances, both in a social sense and in a political sense. And it is that value, that right to associational life, that right to actually be engaged with each other in spite of our differences that I think Kannabiran's right to life also seeks to protect. So I, that's the second part of my, my discussion. Um, and the third thing that I wish to say is that um, um, the very important case, and Kalpana has also talked about this in, in, in some of her other talks on the book, um, the defense of Naxalites in court, which often earned them this question that why would you want to defend those who don't care for the bourgeois nature of the constitution or for bourgeois lawmaking? And Kanabiran's famous um, uh, response to that being it's your values that are under trial, not theirs. And I think there's a lot to be parsed there, again, with respect to the Constitution. Because what is he saying here when he says it's your values that are under trial? And I think it's a marvelous statement. And while it allows him also to speak of the right to politics, it also reminds both the Naxalites and the judges and indeed those that are in power, the, uh, in both uh, the state and the center, that there is something here that we need to think about. What are these values that we wish to defend? and how might we understand them. Um, and I think very clearly these are values that need to be inscribed and re-inscribed at the level of everyday uh, practice of, of criminal jurisprudence, the criminal justice system, whether it is demanding accountability from the local police, whether it's insisting on the rule of law in, in a very defined context, because very, very poignantly, as he says, with respect to the Coimbatore bomb blast case, it's a horrendous incident to, to, to throw a bomb and kill people. And of course, the offenders must be brought to book, but only according to legal procedure. And therefore, the, the, the movement from the affirmation of a principle to the observation of protocols. And I think these are such important lessons that we can, we can only sort of keep repeating again and again, because there's also a tendency to see protocol and procedure as irrelevant. Uh, and that what needs to be affirmed are the larger principles. And however tedious, however painful, and however terribly tiresome and repetitive these might be, um, we might want to remind ourselves that the people of India don't think so. So for those of us who sat in on tribunals, say, to do with uh, sexual assault or with uh, the Prevention of Atrocities Act, it's a, it's a, it's a 
humbling experience to see people file an nth affidavit in court. People who are mostly unlettered, people for whom the laws of this land do very little in an immediate sense, but who still think that those laws and those values are what allow them to stand up for their rights, that grant them voice and presence in the public. So I think in a sense, I think the the, the stress that Kanabiran sets on the quality of legal argument and what is to be done in the courts is, is also something that's not simply about legal practice, but also how practice must necessarily have to be linked to first principles. If you are to reflect those first principles in your practice, that practice should jolly well be adequate to those principles, not in terms of competence and intelligence alone, but also in the manner in which they are exemplified in the doing. And I think there is so much to learn from what men like him achieved in the courts. And I think this is important also because otherwise one is not going to be charged with the passion for the constitution. Um, or the passion for the constitution can sort of expend itself in rhetoric. And, and one might not want that actually, um, beyond the fact that it makes for great eye candy. Um, the passion for the constitution ought to translate into something that's, 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 that's enumerable, that's material and consequential. And here again, I want to go back to Ambedkar and end my uh, discussion with this, which is that in 1954, when he was a member of the Rajya Sabha, and uh, there was a discussion leading to what would eventually become the prevention of uh, violations against civil liberties, the PCR Act, um, subsequently, discussions were being had in the Rajya Sabha on that subject, actually initiated by Ambedkar himself, who um, use the occasion to read from a report prepared by the commissioner who was in charge of the scheduled castes and their protection and law. And he says that what bothers him about the report is not whether it's, you know, it has enough or more incidents or not enough incidents listed, but that it does not seem to be charged with the passion for the defense of the rights of the untouchables. And, and he felt that there was something here that was lacking and which could only be fixed by a serious relationship to constitution, to the constitution. And at this, in his Rajya Sabha speech, he invokes um, the example of the fate of civil liberties legislation in the United States and points to how at one point there was the possibility of setting up a constitutional court to um, ensure that civil liberties that had been enacted for the protection of African Americans would actually be realized in some, in some ways. And he wondered if India should also not have a constitutional court and if some crimes that, especially those that Dalits experience, ought not to be treated as crimes against the constitution itself. So it's a very interesting kind of a, a, a intervention that he makes. And I think this is this is something that um, that that you that I was reminded of again and again when, you know, for today's talk, I went back and leafed through the speaking constitution again. That in a country which is so easily given to iconizing. Um, it's so important to remind ourselves that the spirit of the constitution is something that can only come alive in the doing of the constitution, even if it is a very modest doing that we all undertake in our own context, um, or even if it is something that does not extend beyond holding the local police tana accountable for whatever it fails to do or whatever it does by way of uh, you know, trampling on people's rights. I think there is that nitty gritty aspect to to retaining one's faith in the constitution. And many of us, and I'm sure Kalpana will agree as well, learned this while doing work on the women's question. Because much of this had to do with the everyday realities of violence, of suffering, but also equally of the labor that women expend and which they want recognized and valued. And so therefore, whether it is you're supporting someone in a maintenance case in a family court, or whether you're assisting someone to prosecute a case um, in the case of someone who's endured sexual assault, you realize that so much of it has to do with the details of everyday life, with what you want for yourself, with how you see your relationship to the community of which you are a part, to your children. And you're never away from the everydayness of life when you do all of this. And the law then becomes something that cannot be separated from the everydayness of life. And how do you therefore work with the law with a sense of uh, both the gravity of what is at stake but also with what the law holds within it by way of promise. Um, and I think the women's movement has taught us a number of lessons in this regard. Uh, it has also let us down greatly in, in, in several ways. But nevertheless, uh, we have not entirely given up on working with the legal system or with the constitutional apparatus. 
and um, and I think um, we owe a great deal to to KGK and and the kind of work that he undertook, and also for the kind of uh, precedents that men like him set, which I think uh, are worth remembering and recalling from time to time. And I'm so glad that Katna decided to translate these from Telugu into English and make them available to a wide readership, reminding many of us who had been one-time activists in the civil liberties movement that we must not sort of uh, ever, ever feel abject about the intent of civil liberties. Thank you very much. Um, I, I made the right choice <laughs> in, in letting Geeta Ji go first. Uh, thank you so much uh, for for that contribution and uh, so I'll I think in sort of reducing order where Kalpana Ji had four points, Geeta Ji had broadly three points in terms of the discussion that I wanted to bring forth, I wanted to focus on two aspects of uh, from in terms of my and how the how the speaking constitution spoke to me when I sort of went back to it when I got the invite from Kalpana Ji and having first read it when the book came out it was uh, a great excuse to sort of go back to it from and and take the time out from you know your regular work and 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 all of that but before before moving to both of those points I wanted to just flag this excerpt that uh, I think speaks to a lot of what. Kita ji was saying and also what Kalpana ji was saying earlier and this is from this is page 14 of my copy which is the paperback and where uh, it says that I believe that we have not taken our constitution as seriously as we should have and we are paying the price for that neglect the constitution is not merely another piece of legislation it is a political declaration the people are behind the constitution People's movements are behind it. People's aspirations guide it. Our failure to understand the constitution in this manner has resulted in our negation of its power as a political declaration. This has also resulted in the complete disconnect we see today between the judgments from our courts and the values of the freedom struggle in the constitution. And this, to me speaks very uh, directly to the first point that I wanted to flag, which is that the book brings forth in a timeless way the deep-seated problem in the structure of laws and the legal system in India, independent India as it stands, even after the constitution, and speaks to how it speaks to that point of disconnect between having the constitution, constitutional values, and the point about doing uh, actively something with those constitutional values and just having that document as something that we must sort of abide by when we are passing laws as just another sort of checkbox in terms of the legislative exercise as something that sets the lowest common denominator that our legislators must follow and every other branch of state must follow and not treat it as a political declaration. And I want to flag that point with very specific examples of the idea of state violence and state power, which both are very vividly brought through uh, various parts of the speaking constitution because of the work that Kanabiran did. Uh, there is obviously an explicit element to this, which is the physical brutality of violence, either in the form of encounters or in the form of smaller and much more mundane acts of violence, such as being being seated at the police station for the entire day without any ability to question why have you been summoned there or ask for any justification as to when can you go back. And there are also implicit terms of violence that are weaved through the legal structure. And this is, again, uh, so borne out in what we are seeing right now in uh, bulldozers becoming much more common in how justice is sort of being wanted to be meted out where it's not that there is an abuse of power but if we look closely at these laws we look at how difficult it is to actually question the exercise of power itself with the executive because the legal structure itself vests power almost unbridled power at that with the executive the only questions that we can ask are not to courts but to the executive and the decision that that superior body within the executive makes is final and can't be questioned. On top of which the cherry on top, as it may be, is that there is a presumption of good faith not given to the citizen 
but given to the official who is carrying out whatever actions that are being carried out under these laws. So we, we do have at the same time ideas of constitutional values and constitutional morality that, that are brought in with the document. But when we look at the exercise of doing justice to the constitutional values, it becomes very difficult. It becomes much more difficult because of the existing structure of the laws themselves. So even if we were to argue that the rule of law is a value, is something that deserves our respect and our protection, when we question what exactly this rule of law stands for, we turn around and find that this is actually a proxy for a rule by law, where the, where the statute is doing little more than providing a convenient proxy for the executive to make decisions to its liking. And leaving the citizens, those who gave to themselves the constitution, powerless to question those decisions in a manner that actually provides for real accountability rather than paper-based accountability, which then requires a much more concerted effort to look at those laws, look at the structure of the system to deal with the implicit violence that the laws force upon the people themselves. Without that, it becomes it becomes practically impossible to question the everyday violence that people are living with. A great example of this is interactions with the police that are detailed throughout the book. The one extreme example of this is obviously encounters. But what about everyday interactions with the police? And here again, we are forced to reckon with the point that the book makes about the gap between our judgments and the constitution's values. When we look at how the Supreme Court itself has considered those interactions between the common man and the police, and in a in a decision of a bench of 11 justices of the Supreme Court, which is a decision called uh, Kathikalu Ogad's case, the Supreme Court was faced with this question front and center to look at, should there be a presumption of coercion when a person is in police custody and is asked questions and is required to answer them? There is there are two there are two opinions in that judgment. There is one by eight justices and one by three. But all eleven of them agreed that there is no element of coercion that can be presumed in this encounter itself, and that for me is a very telling intervention, because the court, all eleven of the, all eleven of the justices speak in unison on this point, that there is only an interaction between the police and the and the accused in that state. And this is a person who is in custody inside a police station who is being forced to answer questions without the presence of an advocate. If these circumstances did not tell the court that this is coercion, then it becomes very difficult to imagine what is not coercion in the interaction between the individual and the manifestations of the state. This is just one example, and this is part of the legal system as we are dealing with today. But again, what the speaking constitution shows us is that this is the everyday life of the constitution. The everyday life of the constitution is not how we might think Article 19 or Article 21 for that matter are going to be imagined. It is this everyday negotiation of a power struggle of unimaginable proportions that is being carried out, that is being carried out with some fervor in parts of the country that we will never even hear of as far as the mainstream media are concerned, unless someone brings those interactions to light. It is something that, as was spoken by uh, Gita Ji, a phenomenon that traces much further back than before to 2014. And again, the pro the the moment that we find ourselves in is that a work like the speaking constitution, according to me, will never lose relevance. For instance, uh, and this is something that would not have happened if you would have done this interaction two months ago, we can only turn to what happened just a few days back on the 11th of August when three new bills were introduced in the parliament and placed for discussion with the select committee, which seek to reimagine the Indian Penal Code, the Criminal Procedure Code, and the Indian Evidence Act, claiming those to be colonial documents that require reimagination, but in a process that displays what, according to me, is the 
the most frontal assault on the ideas of what our constitution stands for and could not have been more clear affirmations of what colonial aspirations were. Which therefore makes works like the speaking constitution timeless. It would be too much to delve into great detail as far as those three codes are concerned. But I just wanted to again flag one theme from the new draft of the criminal procedure code, uh, the Sanhita as it is as it is proposed to be called, on, on just one aspect, because it speaks to a very interesting part of the history of the drafting of the earlier law. And again, speaks very directly to this issue of interactions between the individual and the state. And this is the power of the police and executive magistrates in India to deal with bad characters and seek security for keeping the peace. These are the provisions that were habitually used at the time of the colonial government to keep political movements in order. Orders under Section 144 were routinely used to prevent people from exercising their rights to association and free expression. Similarly, orders under what is currently at least Section 107 of the CRPC were routinely passed to prevent people from entering parts of the city and therefore prevent them to give speeches because this was imagined as something that would rile up the population against the oppressive rule. When the, when the 1973 code was being considered, members such as Madhu Limay and several others, in fact, went on for days debating the retention of these provisions. Days. And the debates are there. The debates start on the 9th of May 1973, continue on for that session, are restarted in September. Even after the clause by clause discussion ends, there is a reopening of the discussion on the powers under section 107 and the breadth of those powers. And members of parliament at that point of time condemned the new law as being nothing but paying a lip service, even though it actually provided for greater safeguards, but nevertheless accepted the retention of extraordinary executive power. In the new codes, we find an almost uncritical acceptance of a power balance that has been devised as far back as 1861, which to me could not be a clearer affirmation of colonial moralities, not constitutional moralities. Colonial power balances, not constitutional ones. And if we look past the, and the CRPC, which is the bedrock on which the interaction between the citizen and the state ought to be defined, if that expresses the colonial morality today, then there cannot be any hope for trying, you know, doing constitutionalism in action without meeting a struggle at every point of the way. So that's just the first point on the structure of laws requiring constant confrontation because of the failure to implement constitutional values in action. The second is the point about state mechanics of oppression, which has again been brought up, but deserves specific mention because of again the lived realities that make a work like the speaking constitution timeless. And I would want uh, to bring specific attention to Two, two parts of the book, which were dealing with the civil liberties movement in Andhra Pradesh and the conspiracy trials. And it's remarkable if we turn to these uh, state practices from the late 1960s upwards till the 1990s, as, as uh, the, the book recalls, there is a case where uh, Mr. Kannabiran says that I have been dealing with this case for three decades, please let me be. And, and the structure of how the state creates those prosecutions is fantastic because it speaks to the past as well as the future at that point of time in 1969. It speaks to the past because the archives and this is available, the document is available on the National Archives' website. If we turn to 1915, the government of India at that point, the Home Department issues a memo on conducting prosecutions in conspiracy cases. And in 1969, we see that inspired by that memo, the, the local government at that point in time decides to go five steps further to join events that are completely disparate only with a view to draw as wide a net as possible to make sure that as many people that are 
viewed as uncomfortable to the state can be brought in and prosecuted for years on end. And it was also speaking to the future because several years later, if the if everyone would have been around to see what happened first in respect of prosecutions relating to the Bhima Koregao incidents, and then in respect of the Delhi riots that took place uh, in February of 2020, the same prosecutorial strategies are writ large. A net that is wider than what one can ever hope to conceive of is drawn. Seemingly disparate events are reimagined as being important cogs in a conspiratorial machine for a trial to start, not end, just to start. And that is the mechanism of the state. It is not to pursue the logical end ever. It is just to keep the system in momentum. And that is the process of the oppressive state here as well, where the, the conclusions are irrelevant. The conclusions become irrelevant with the passage of time. What is only relevant is the initial accusation and the fact that the process can sustain that accusation for as long as it can. And it's remarkable the, the clarity with which that, that uh, prosecutorial strategy is played out in the conspiracy cases that are dealt with in the book and how it speaks to what is being dealt with in, by courts and lawyers in, in various parts of the country today. It's as if nothing has changed. And in terms of the fate of these trials, almost all of them ended in complete acquittals. At least for the defendants who were still alive to see those acquittals. Again, a feature that is ominous in terms of how it is being repeated in trials that we are seeing being carried out by the state today. So to broadly sum up both points, the speaking constitution and the themes that it touched upon for better or for worse are timeless themes because of what has been the experience of the Indian constitution and, and the failure to translate the text of the constitution into living those constitutional values, the failure to accept the fact that the constitution is a political document as opposed to treating it as yet another charter that just requires adherence in formalism and on paper. And, and because, and, and the most recent iteration of that being the expression of the three codes that have been, uh, that have been submitted for consideration to the select committee. What the speaking constitution then shows us is again, I think I think the hope becomes better with age and I find it very difficult to subscribe to that fully just yet. But, but maybe it becomes better to find meaning in that struggle and continue with that because maybe that is the path that is left for all of us. And it is, very, it, it, it is still very difficult to see that, that, uh, that light at the end of the tunnel or to continue with the metaphor that boulder resting peacefully atop that mountain. So I think with that, I would uh, close with my remarks and just, just one last small comment, which is uh, which is to lighten the mood as such. Uh, Kalpana ji sort of mentioned that lovely anecdote about IMFJ and IMFL. It reminded me of another quote that I saw in a book about how a republic without a pub is just a relic. So maybe it wasn't uh, it wasn't actually that accidental to link IMFJ and IMFL after all. So with that, I'll just close my remarks. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak and have be a part of this lovely panel. Thank you. Thanks, Abhinav, and thanks, Geeta. Thank you for uh, for your comments. Uh, in the interest of time, because we do have an audience waiting, uh, Kalpana, if that's okay, I might open it up for Q&A and we'll sure. come back to you for concluding remarks towards the end. Is, is that okay? Yeah, sure. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we're now open for Q&A. Uh, what I'd recommend doing is, um, if those of you who have questions could raise your hands virtually. Uh, I should be able to let you into the Zoom call and allow you to ask your question. Uh, questions in the chat box, Udit. Yes, we could take those up while people 
uh, fiddle around with their Zoom call and figure out how to raise their hands. Oh, I do have a hand up from Rochna. Uh, go ahead, Rochna. You need to unmute yourself, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. I'm so sorry I've, uh, I'm on uh, the move and I haven't uh, managed to get the camera and things on, but this has been uh, a tremendous panel and I'm very grateful to um, Kalpana ji and to uh, Abhinav and uh, Geeta ji for um, uh, coming. But I think, yeah, so I, I, I wanted to just start with, with, in a sense, the problem that Abhinav's remarks sort of left us with, which is uh, that on the one hand, um, we have to acknowledge that uh, the lived reality of um, encounters with the state is very far from constitutional morality and values. But on the other hand, um, those uh, values are what animates the political struggles for a better, uh, if you like, uh, tomorrow or a better um, yeah, um, way forward. Um, and I was just wondering, and I'm, I mean, I'm still, a, I'm really looking forward to uh, learning more about um, Kannabiran's, uh, uh, Professor Kannabiran's work, but how he saw uh, uh, the way to sort of try to reconcile this, this contradiction that on the one hand, there is this huge sort of distance between what we see as sort of, you know, as it's a paper constitution or paper values, but on the other hand, to see the, those as not being as it, as it were relevant to um, political life is also to give up on one of the few sources of uh, support <laughs> that uh, the powerless have uh, in um, in calling the powerful to account. Um, so, um, I mean, wh how did and what were the some of the ways in which he sought to reconcile that uh, in his uh, work? Anyone can take that? Adina, you want to take that? Uh, why don't you take that, actually? I think it'll be... Uh... Uh, well, I uh, I think, uh, you know, fr from my understanding uh, of, of uh, his work, uh, right through, right from the very beginning, he was uh, very, very um, uh, tuned in uh, to the contradictions uh, between, uh, you know, uh, between uh, uh, what uh, the uh, what the spirit embodied, or what the text of the constitution said, and what was happening in courts, and I think that that uh, is uh, the that that is the one problem that you see running through both the books. The Wages of Impunity and the Speaking Constitution, where he's constantly trying to bring the debate back into uh, an anti-colonial interpretation of laws uh, in the light of the Constitution. Um, I, do, I don't know if this answers your question, um, Rochna, no, it, uh, it does. Yeah. No, can I just it, come in for a bit, Rochna? Because I think one of the key terms that Kanabiran flags, both directly and indirectly, is the role of broad democratic politics in actually enabling a way of working with civil rights and the law. Because to going back to what Abhinav was saying, that maybe when, when one gets older, one might have a sense of hope. But I think the hopelessness also is very much a part of where we are today. And as one of the questions in the chat box points out, what does it mean to assert a right to politics when mobilization on the streets or indeed in any in favor of anyone who's facing a violation of rights is becoming near impossible? I think one of the things that perhaps enable Kanabiran and others in the civil rights movement to hold that tension between the spirit of the constitution and its context and its content and the everyday violation of that spirit through very, as Abhinav was saying, everyday police practices. I mean, all of us have had the experience of sitting for hours in police stations, not knowing if we would go back home at the end of the day. 
So there is that everyday encounter with the state, which has not at is, is never ever propitious. But on the other hand, at certain moments in history, it seems possible to push for a way of working with the constitution that's enabling in spite of this vast gap that divides the spirit and the body of, of the polity, in so to speak. And I think Kanabiran's work was undertaken at such a moment, though he had his quarrels with the far left, and there were many, um, he also saw in the vibrant assertion of an entire cohort of people, many of whom were from extremely impoverished, marginal circumstances, determined to have their say in politics. I think he took his cue from that sort of an energy and that sort of a, of a moment. And I think what therefore animates the spirit of his arguments in court and also his reading of the constitution, um, it owes as much to the power of democratic movements and perhaps not so democratic movements also, but which were essentially movements that insisted on their right to rebellion. And if you leave out the role of people's movements in the const in the perpetration of constitutional values and, and see that as only in terms of the spirit and, and the everyday acts of the state, um, then we might in some ways perhaps end up um, affirming what the state today wants us to affirm. And the challenge, of course, is what is happening to the, the to broad democratic politics today. And of course, it's in crisis, but this perhaps ought to also make us reflect on how might we imaginatively push the boundaries of political action itself. Is political action going to be the kind that was enabling, say, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or do we need a different sort of politics? which is equally democratic, but also which perhaps is unfolding around us in ways that we perhaps don't fully grasp yet. And for yeah. me personally, that has to do with the assertion of uh, Bahujans, Dalits and Adivasis today in different ways. And I think there is something there we might want to think about. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly what I was trying to uh, yeah get to in this book is so important for us to think this question through because it's about what uh, democratic politics and democratic movements can do to bridge that gap. And I mean, in his case, what's interesting, as you say, is that he may reject the orthodox left or the, or the left of the time or that, the models of political action that are embodied in, in those movements, uh, but not entirely. And uh, that he would also see the role of courts and the law in organizing political movements. So I'm th that's what I'm sort of trying to get at, to try to extract from uh, his work also a, pra uh, a uh, if you like, principles for a practice, uh, a democratic practice of, of resistance, uh, which involves, um, yeah, which, which involves the left, but is not off, uh, yeah, it doesn't sort of adopt, adopt its um, models um, in, um, uncritically, but it, it it also so how how does the sort of civil liberties movement of which he was such an important part um, provide say models for political action uh, today uh, and um, yeah ways in which it uses courts also strategically how 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 can we use uh, courts and others not not just when we know how flawed uh, if you like uh, you know their workings are can we still use them in ways that can um, yeah, strengthen this, um, uh, the right to politics and, and the politics of, of resistance to executive power, which uh, we need around the world today. Well, if I can just uh, come in a, uh, briefly and I uh, take a couple of the other uh, questions too. I think there, there were really um, several sites uh, where he saw the right to politics play out. One was uh, within the space of uh, civil liberties movements. The second was within the space of radical left movements, which were quite distinctive. And the third was within the space of courts. And uh, in each of these spaces, uh, you know, his insistence on deliberating over the meanings of political action, uh, deliberating over the non-negotiability, uh, deliberating over setting out the non-negotiables in each space. So your insistence in courts, for instance, on 
the right of um, left dissenters uh, to politics. But also we must remember during the emergency, it was the Jansung as well uh, and the RSS, not only the left. So that there was that, uh, you know, the, that range uh, of politics uh, that he said must actually be deliberated on and it can't just be treated with uh, uh, th through a carceral uh, mode. Uh, and, and this is a conversation uh, he keeps having in court. Uh, one of the instances for inst uh, that he cites in the speaking constitution, for instance, is where he hands the judge a copy of the communist manifesto and starts reading from it. I mean, you know, so it's this, the court is actually uh, uh, for him, a space of public education for everybody, yeah, and a, a space of political education. And uh, so, and, and while uh, one part of that, an important part of that political education is uh, uh, the constitution itself as a political document, the other part of that political education is in a court that is generally and has generally from Gopalan's time been hostile to communism, to make the court actually sit and listen to and understand the principles on which communist politics is built. Not to just reduce it to its most, uh, uh, you know, uh, banal constructions, but to try and understand um, uh, you know, understand the richness of political philosophy, if you like, yeah. Uh, but that actually he got judges to uh, sit and listen to him um, with movements as well. I did, and and uh, Gita uh, kind of uh, dwelt on this uh, in her talk that there uh, there are, of course, a series of uh, political actions uh, that uh, movements may take, uh, that individuals within movements may take, that Kader may engage in. Uh, he wasn't always in agreement with all of that, but uh, there, there were very clear lines that he drew and, and, and very, uh, you know, a very clear, um, you know, uh, path of negotiation and deliberation he took with movements as well. And in APCLC, for instance, there was that whole debate between state violence and private violence, which we don't have the time to go into now. But these are large debates on movement politics that animated civil liberties circles as well. Uh, you also had in that civil liberties space women, for instance, uh, Vindhya and Vasanta Lakshmi were part of that uh, space where they actually brought domestic violence into the meaning of a violence that civil liberties movements must begin to deal with for the first time. So it was again feminists within the civil liberties movement who bring domestic violence onto this. So politics of different kinds, politics of different orders, you know, get debated in very, very different ways and in different sites. On uh, 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 Ankita's uh, question, you know, the first one, I mean, BJP can describe its own politics as a process of decolonization. I think it's uh, basically, I, I wouldn't even worry about that except to call them out, you know? Um, and uh, how might KJK see decolonization and law in the constitution? He has written extensively about this in the wages of impunity. In fact, the, uh, the two chapters in wages of in impunity where he talks about colonial baggage and he talks about personal liberty post-independence are precisely on this, on how uh, the, the constitution is actually um, in essence uh, counter-colonial uh, counter and must only be um, interpreted in counter-colonial terms. And of course, he's drawing uh, in, in his understanding of the constitution, he's drawing very, um, uh, uh, very much on uh, Dr. Ambedkar's uh, writing on, uh, on, on the constitution itself and on constituent assembly debates. Uh, he cites them at length in uh, the wages of impunity. Um, on, on tribunals, I don't think he was ever, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we need to kind of try and understand 
his participation in commissions of inquiry and citizens' tribunals on the one hand, and his litigation uh, in courts on the other, uh, a bit differently. Uh, I, I don't think, with the Muktadar Commission uh, to, into the, that investigated, inquired into the rape of uh, Ramizabi and the custodial death of Ahmed Hussain, uh, it was a sitting judge in the High Court. Uh, Justice Muktadar was a sitting judge in the High Court. And uh, the policeman got uh, the case actually transferred via the Supreme Court to another state because they said that a trial judge in the state where a sitting judge has ruled against them would be biased against them. And the Supreme Court allowed it and transferred it to uh, Raichur, where the policemen were acquitted and the Bangalore High Court sustained the acquittal. Uh, the, uh, so in, in terms of citizens' tribunals, uh, you don't even have that movement from a commission of inquiry to a court, at least in the Ramizabi case. And I, I don't know of any of the other commissions of inquiry that he was part of, where case actually got heard, uh, I mean, uh, went through a trial post a commission of inquiry where he participated. Um, the uh, With citizens tribunal uh, tribunals, I think what he was quite clear about was that this was an exercise in public accountability, and that this this was uh, this was uh, an exercise in uh, you know uh, a, a, a public constitutionalism, if you like. Uh, the uh, but if some of those cases, uh, like in Gujarat, actually uh, went to courts and uh, you have uh, Bilkes Banu's case, you have several cases in, in Gujarat that uh, went to court. It was of course drawing on the experience uh, of, of the citizens tribunal, but it was a completely, um, it, it was a separate process in which he was not involved. And I don't think uh, he uh, really believed that uh, people's tribunals uh, uh, have a diminishing power. I think, on the other hand, it uh, the, the his approach to it, you know, from his reflections on Ayodhya, uh, as well as uh, the Gujarat Tribunal, was that these are uh, 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 an ex extension and an expansion of the practice of fact finding, which had to be done as part of citizen responsibility. And to follow up on that is the task of human rights movements, civil liberties movements, and lawyers. But uh, the refusal of courts to uh, take on board the arguments of civil liberties movements or of lawyers appearing for uh, survivors and families of victims did not necessarily mean to him that people's tribunals had diminished in power. They had their role to play. And I uh, don't think he kind of um, believed that, uh, uh, that that role was ever uh, not important or diminishing uh, in importance. Um, also with his participation uh, in the peace process, uh, there was no doubt in his mind uh, that uh, the government would uh, be treacherous at the first opportunity, and it was. But yet he believed that one had to negotiate, that you had to bring them to the negotiating table. The, the important uh, move there was to bring the government and the Maoists to the negotiating table, and it was a Herculean task, and civil liberties groups did accomplish it. So I think that we need to see these as, as interconnected, but not necessarily, um, you know, uh, uh, related to one another in terms of uh, action and consequence. Yeah, uh, there's no causality between them, but they are certainly interconnected, often parallel processes, all of them uh, extremely important and needing to be done. Thank you. Um, 
we have we have a very long list of questions so i'm going to start uh, uh yeah. combining some of them if that's okay um but before i read them out i just wondered if any of the um ankita would you like to come in and ask your question just wanted to yeah ankita yeah i already i she's already responded to uh, my question i was i was just thinking that i asked the first question keeping the whole ucc uh, thing in mind i was you know there is this sort of uh, for a long time the, the feminist groups were asking for the ucc and now we have a version of the ucc that makes the women's movement sort of not uh, go into that territory at all and i was worrying that the same is becoming the case with uh, the constitution you know for a long time progressives have been asking for decolonization of the constitution and now the three quotes come and we're sort of worried that uh, in the name of decolonization what we have is what uh, Vigita mentioned you know this sort of particular view of decolonization which is the return of Hindu power and glory but let me not take any more time she's she's already uh, responded to my questions. Be Thank careful you. what you ask for. Uh, <laughs> yes. I think I have another question from Shantan. Would Shantan would you like to uh, if Shantan's still on the call would would you like to come in as well? Um, you you're on mute. Shantan's question is: Given the emphasis, not only yes, yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll, my question. I'll just say it very quickly. So, given the emphasis, not just on rule rule of law, but on the spirit of the constitution behind it. Did uh, KGK have an idea of constitutional education, spreading it amongst movements, amongst law colleges, amongst uh, masses in particular? If yes, what was his propositions? What was his roadmap towards doing the same? Uh, do you, would you like to comment on that maybe? All right, perfect. I think that might be a question for Kalpana. And while you answer that, I'll just quickly add uh, a second question. Uh, which I think speaks to Geeta's uh, question uh, point about the right to politics. And one of our attendees asks, what happens to the right to politics when public spaces to protest the state are disappearing or the publics are prevented from assembling in today's India, except for those who are patronized by the state, like the Badrang Dal? What would have KGK's opinion been on the state of India's judiciary today in the context of the right to politics? So I... Uh, yeah, uh, Kalpana, if you want to answer Shantan's question, then we can go on to... Uh, but on, like... on um, you know, I, I, I don't think uh, he, uh, you know, particularly spoke about law colleges. I think um, he had a large uh, following among young lawyers uh, and law students and university students generally. Um, and uh, his approach to his work was to explain it, uh, in, like Gita said, in large meetings that had hundreds of people. Yeah, and um, and he wrote constantly in newspapers uh, on all issues of um, public relevance. Uh, and of course, he believed that, you know, the, the Constitution is uh, something that must, uh, you know, must be understood by all. I think his objective of agreeing to the oral memoir in Telugu being serialized weekly was precisely that, to start, a, you know, a popular uh, kind of conversation um, uh, among people who among the widest cross section of people, not just law students, but also lay people on what the constitution actually means and what uh, the rule of law means. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, no, he, he wasn't uh, talking uh, particularly uh, about law colleges alone. Yeah, uh, even while uh, being focused quite a bit on uh, the legal profession, I mean, on lawyers. Or, I mean, that, that was a special constitu constituency for him to educate and have conversations and uh, meetings with um, lawyers, particularly young lawyers. Gita. Yes, um, I think the present moment is, is extremely worrying and, and all of us are 
rightly concerned about what is the future of dissenting politics or indeed of any politics that is not in line with what the ruling powers affirm as politics. Um, but perhaps we should also ask ourselves if uh, there isn't a new kind of politics that might yet be possible, which perhaps does not have to do with the kinds of mobilizations on the streets, with the assertion of um, the limits of state rule and, 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 a, and, a, and a very um, in-your-face affirmation of fundamental rights. Um, but I think given, and very quickly, just to look at some very specific kinds of examples, for instance, in 2016, following Rohit Vemula's death um, and the kind of imbroglio that emerged in places like the Jawaharlal Nehru University and the University of Hyderabad, um, JNU organized an entire series of lectures, Freedom Square lectures and so on and so forth. Some of you might remember that. Now, one of the questions that somebody raised was, well, this is a continuation in a creative sense of an older mode of doing politics, where you affirm the right to carry on discussion and debate as you wish. There's also quite a revolution that is happening in our classrooms where a new demographic has emerged of students from Bahujan, Dalit, and minority communities and a number of women. And they are pushing the limits of what should be an ideal curriculum in the social sciences or in the humanities, or perhaps even in law. And new questions are being asked about what ought we to be learning, what ought we to be studying, what should constitute the subject of our inquiries. And while this might not have the kind of political punch that public action has, there's a very quiet revolution that emerged in pockets of the country. And I think it continues in different ways within classrooms and outside of it. It has made several vernacular language writers rethink what is a canon, what is the literary canon, what is our history, what is culture that is affirming and so on. And these follow a very different durée. It's not the durée of everyday politics. And how might we build on energies like that, which have, which are part of the, which, is, which if you want to use a Marxist term, which is the other arm of the dialectic. The one arm is the rise of, uh, you know, neoliberal capital supported by, um, by, by a coercive state. But this long-term development that we have seen over the decades has also emerged in a new demographic of protest. And I've just given you one specific example. Or, or think of think of the fate that attended Stan Swami. We, well, we're all anguished at what happened to him. Stan Swami also stood for something that we haven't yet fully grasped. What 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 unfolded in Jharkhand uh, over the last few decades in terms of you know, PESA, of course, but also in terms of the many rights that were being argued for and fought for in the face of terror, violence, and, and so on. And likewise in Chhattisgarh. So I think there are moments that are that have unfolded, and perhaps they might be refolded within within state action and coercive violence, but they also point to the fact that there are several uh, segments of the people of India who have not stopped asking questions or continue to do so in the teeth of opposition. And for me, it's always, it is those pockets that also constitute politics that might prove inspiring, even if it doesn't have a resolution or has a tragic resolution. Or very recently, the Wire carried yesterday a report of a women's group's visit to Manipur. And while it's very sad reading and it's very worrying to read, you also see what, how might one make sense of something like Manipur from a feminist point of view? What might one want to focus on? What are the issues that we should consider important? And what have women whose faces we don't know, whose names we don't know, continuing to do to retain a modicum of civility and decency in an extremely difficult time in Manipur? So I think there are pockets of action and reaction from amongst the citizenry that we might want to take our cues from. And also, as, as, a, as, a, as a kind of an itinerant teacher, I also see a lot of hope in the kinds of questions young people continue to ask in different forums and in different ways. And they may not add up to a politics with a grand P. They may not add up to the kind of democratic upsurge we witnessed in the 70s and 80s, but they might yet lead to something that we haven't entirely grasped or anticipated. And the challenge is to push the political imagination to go beyond what it understands by progressive politics and to think of other ways of engaging with the political as well. So that's how I would see what is the possibility of politics and how might we assert a right to politics. And I think we have to assert it to ourselves first, that there is a possibility for politics and look for it in places that perhaps we are not used to looking for. 
Thank you. There's, uh, I suppose uh, Gita's already answered some of this question, but a further question from Tanya says, uh, how does one deal with the challenge of the explicitly partisan oppressive intentions of the state while ascribing to constitutional values? If the state manipulates laws to meet its own constitutional unconstitutional agendas, what could inspire one to keep at it? And how does one then not succumb to hopelessness? And what could be our takeaway from Kanabir and Sir's work in philosophy? I guess I've answered that, but I just want to end with a, <laughs> just add a small anecdote. Recently, I read of the arrest of one of Russia's longtime dissidents, um, Boris Kagarlitsky, who has been sort of at different points punctuating uh, politics in post-Soviet uh, Russia in different ways. And then I thought to myself, this is a coda to a very long history of oppression and state terror in, 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 in that part of the world. But uh, there seems to be something in the history of uh, Russia, if not the larger geography of the Soviet Union, which in a, again and again pushes people to the front lines. And what is that history? Why are they doing this even when they know that this is not going to result in anything tangible, but which nevertheless must be done? Going back to Kanabiran and, and the labor of Sisyphus, I think politics essentially is Sisyphean labor. Um, there are no endpoints that might make this worthwhile in the present, but it's also a risk that one must wager, no? And I think that's that's what this is all about, apart from victory or defeat. Abhinav, you want to take that question? The one I, who... I don't think I'll be able to fully answer it, but I do want to say that, uh, I mean, in terms of hopelessness and... So there is obviously the point that if we lose hope, then there's really not, like, not much left after that. But having said that, I think the in terms of what to do towards not uh, going down that path, I think is the remembrance that no matter how bleak it seem, it is the, the, the right to ask questions and the right to demand justifications is something that nobody can take away from us. And, and the moment we, uh, for so long as we remember that, so long as we keep adhering to that and, we were willing to express that even in the most mildest of forms in our day-to-day -day lives, it doesn't require extraordinary acts of courage every day, but it definitely does require a reaffirmation frequently enough for us to keep remembering that it's it's all it's necessary for the state to answer our questions. And to answer those questions, we must also stand up to ask them. So I, I think so long as we engage in that process, it's not all all bleak. It's not all hopeless. I imagine IMFL is also a very good antidote to some of that hopelessness. <laughs> Kalpana, would you like the last word? Oh, you're on mute. Not, not really. I, I think Abhinav's, uh, you know, uh, response kind of summed it up quite neatly that, you know, you, uh, what is left? If, if, if you lose hope, there's nothing left. Uh, on on uh, the state manipulating laws uh, for its own unconstitutional agendas, again, both uh, Abhinav and uh, Gita uh, pointed to the fact that uh, you know what uh, you know the 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 labors of Sisyphus, if you like, uh, were long before two thousand fourteen. Uh, yeah, and uh, in a sense, uh, civil liberties lawyers would have very little work if the state was completely well behaved and disciplined and constitutional and accountable. It is state accountability, uh, state, uh, the, the refusal of the state to be accountable that, uh, you know, uh, must, uh, you know, uh, persuade us to just stay on our feet and there, you know, uh, fighting and demanding accountability. And um, I, I, hopelessness is uh, not a choice at all. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. On that note of hope and optimism, please join me in thanking our speaker and our discussants for a fascinating event today.
Um, and thank you, thank you all of you for your time, for, for your comments. Um, just a reminder, PACT is of course one modest uh, attempt at keeping this conversation going on constitutional values, on the constitutional text, but also uh, the kind of normative grammar and the values that, uh, that emerge from the constitution as tools in political struggles. Uh, please do keep, uh, keep an eye on our website. And if you have any suggestions for events or features, we're very open to hearing those. Uh, if you go on our website, there is a contact form. Uh, do feel free to get in touch. Uh, we love hearing from people who attend events, people who are really users of some of the uh, work that PACT is putting out there. But thank you once again to Kalpana, to Geeta, and to Abhishek. And I uh, uh, hope you have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Abhinav, Geeta, and Udit, Roshna, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.